Hello, and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. Throughout the presidential campaign, candidate Donald Trump often implored his supporters to treat protesters very, very rough. After moving into the White House, Trump has frequently blasted professional athletes who have taken their protests to the football field. But when people in Iran took to the streets at the end of last year, Trump was suddenly espousing his love for protesters, at least some of them. <clears throat> On this month's Other Voices, we'll take a look at what's behind Trump's sudden love of Iranian protesters and what that might have to do with the historic nuclear accord with that country, something Trump clearly does not love. We'll also look into Trump's continuing Muslim ban, which is definitely not an expression of love toward those same Iranians who were recently protesting. Joining us uh, to help us unwind uh, all these questions, I'm pleased to welcome Dornaz Mamarzia. Dornaz is the Northern California field organizer for the National Iranian American Council. Dornaz joined NIAC in November 2017 as the Northern California field organizer. She left Iran with the, be with the dream of being a human rights activist. She worked in the area of human rights and women's rights at Freedom House and Persianet Global Network. Dornaz is a staunch advocate of the LGBTQ community. Before joining NIAC, she worked for the Commission on the Status of Women and the LGBTQ Commission of San Mateo County. Dornaz, welcome to Other Voices. Thank you so much for coming down here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, before we get into the questions I outlined, uh, take a couple of minutes to tell people what NIAC does, and there's actually two parts to the organization, right? There's exactly. the, the Council, the National Running and American Council, and NIAC Action. I'm sure they're blended, but it's probably a tax. But tell us what NIAC does. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, since 2002, NIAC has grown to become the largest organization representing Iranian American. So it emerged as a trusted source on matters important to the Iranian American community. And before NIAC, we didn't have such an organization in the United States to represent Iranian American community. So NIAC uh, been consulted by Congress and White House many times, and NIAC members are coming from different age groups and uh, representing all the community through 50 states in the United States. So we uh, basically engage lawmakers to make sure Iranian Americans have a voice on Capitol Hill. We're supporting human rights and opposing war and sanctions that hurt Iranian uh, people in Iran. So through advocacy information and education, we provide a powerful tool and voice for the Iranian American community. Uh, and we're trying to promote their engagement in the politi uh, political process and advances their rights. Um, so NIAC often um, teams up with organizations such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and other human rights organizations to talk about violation of human rights in Iran. Um, so NIAC has been pioneered in um, securing and encouraging the Iran deal, as known as JCPOA. Um, three years ago, we prevented war many times through our lobbying um, effort uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, and yeah, as a whole, we are securing the rights of Iranian American community. Uh, how state. large is the Iranian American community? So there is no specific number for that, unfortunately. And there is no option on census to mention that we are Iranian American or even Middle Eastern. So huh. um, yeah, we are Caucasian. We are white. Yeah. And in all the applications, all the process, we are considered as white. That's why uh, we, we don't have any representative. We are not considered as an official minority in the United States. Interesting. Huh. Even huh. our effort to, uh, put not, uh, to put Iranian or Middle Eastern among the list of minorities in 2020 census was failed, unfortunately. Huh. Yes. Yeah, but we're going to be asked about our citizenship, apparently, on, <laughs> on the census. Yeah, that's right. And so let me talk to you about NIAC Action. So NIAC sure. Action 
is a sister organization of NIAC, which works to strengthen the Iranian-American community and promote greater understanding between the Iranian and American people. So uh, we are working to maximize the political influence of Iranian-Americans and pro-peace community to ensure that we have a powerful voice on the issues that matter to us. So, uh, unfortunately, Iranian Americans are highly, highly underrepresented at government. So mm. I had experience of working for the local government, and during the whole work, I didn't see any Iranian, not even one Middle Eastern. Huh. So you, are you encouraging people to run for office? Is that not only we are encouraging people to run for office, we're encouraging people to go and vote and support <laughs> minorities. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to return to the work of, of NIAC uh, later on in the program, but I do want to get to the question of the, um, the demonstrations that we just saw at the end of the year, kind of crossing over uh, New Year's, late December, early, early January. And I actually want to start this by looking back to 2009. I think a lot of people remember the Green Movement protests, the massive pro-democracy protests following the apparently stolen fraudulent elections in 2009 in Iran. And the reason I want to start there is because with this latest series of protests, uh, in his tweets, Donald Trump implied that these were very similar. And a lot of media coverage also implied that it was, was very similar. So let's start by reviewing what happened in 2009 um, and then We'll compare it to what just happened, but let, let's start with talking about 2009 because it was quite a um, noticeable movement, um, quite dramatic, uh, and you were there for that. Were, were exactly, you I left Iran right after the Green Movement, uh -huh. and I'm one of those victims. So the, that, inc the political incident happened in 2009, forced me and my family to leave the country. As a result of the as protests. a result of the protests and, about? and political instability, um, yes, as you mentioned, uh, the protest was uh, over uh, the fraudulent election, and people were claiming that the votes uh, were stolen, like the thing happened here. So, but unfortunately, in Iran, people do not have voice, or if they have voice, there is no follow up on the election. So, and the protest happened, and I can tell you that. There is a huge difference between the protests happened in um, 2017-18 and uh, protests happened in 2009. So how would you characterize um, the 2009 protests? They truly were a pro-democracy uh, movement. It was pro-democracy and uh, the, the majority of chants were over where is my vote, freedom of speech, and free political prisoners, while the recent protests were a reaction of Iranian to broken economy, uncontrolled corruption, and increasing fuel and food prices. So years of political, economic, and social grievances have driven some Iranian into the streets. So anytime there is protest going inside of Iran, it's essential to know that it's legitimate expression of very diverse socioeconomic sort of Iranian society. So by saying that, um, they want to say that our political and social grievances have gone unmet for far too long. So uh, Yeah, so uh, in 2009, just to remind people, this was um, the re-election campaign of Ahmadinejad, Ahmadinejad. Um, who was not very popular, and one of the more popular reformers, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. uh, Mir Hossein Musavi, is that how I say it? Um, and he kind of became a leader of the pro-democracy movement. And as I understand these recent protests, they were more leaderless, that, that they were actually kicked off because um, the, the, the national budget, the, the federal budget, was leaked. And mm -hmm. people actually got to see where the money was going. And they saw that subsidies were going to be cut, fuel prices were going to be increased. But the, the mullahs were getting their, um, the various religious institutions and the Revolutionary Guard, their budgets were going up. Do I have that roughly exactly. right? Exactly, yes, as you mentioned, yeah. And people ask for accountability. 
there is no accountability over that Islamic foundations. So um, every, each year, the government allocates a huge amount of money for those foundations, and there is no accountability. What, is, what do these foundations do that are getting so much of the, of the budget? Oh, well, it varies. It controls the whole country, so they work as a mafia behind the scenes. So, for example, Revolutionary Guard, known as Sepah in Iran, so they control everything. Uh -huh. If you're going to do it like a small business in Iran, you should pay taxes, unofficial taxes, to IRGC, unfortunately. So people see these inequalities, people feel these inequalities and waste of money in the government. And um, these protests, I believe, was the purely reaction of people to that level of corruption. So w did the people in Iran tie this at all to um, the nuclear agreement? The, the great hope uh, of, of Iran in signing onto this agreement, and uh, I think you probably might agree with me that this nuclear accord really was an historic accord. We're going to talk about it more. But the great hope was that uh, not only US sanctions, but other international sanctions against Iran, mm -hmm. um, not all of them, but those related to the nuclear program would be lifted and it would benefit the Iranian economy. What happened? So before talking about the nuclear deal and the impacts of nuclear deal on Iran society, let's talk about the main reason of the protest. So even though we think that the main reason of the protest was economic, but it's really hard to separate economic from the political. So it's been the uh, government longstanding economic mismanagement, nepotism, and corruption that created the economic mess. So we can easily ignore that nuclear part, uh -huh. nuclear deal part, and just talk about economic mismanagement the corruption and economic mess in the country. So in fact, yeah, also outside forces such as economic sanctions worsen all the situation and economic problems in Iran. But the government has the responsibility to address all the grievances. So the gap between the state and the people that existed in 2009 will exist in future. Mm -hmm. And so, it's getting wider and wider. So unless all the demands address in a sustainable manner. So um, it, it really was protests against the existing uh, government of Iran and the way they are conducting themselves and really not taking care of, of business at, at home. That's right. Uh, That's exactly right. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the protest was without any leader. So there wasn't any leader from both fictions, reformists or conservative, to lead the protest. And in some cases, we saw that the people chanted anti-government slogan and tear down Khamenei's picture in small cities. The interesting point about uh, this protest is that they started in small cities, the cities we'd never heard of. So I'm a native Iranian. And I've never heard of many cities that the protests Interesting. happened. Interesting. Yeah, it was much more rural, whereas in 2009 it was That's a very urban exactly protest. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so um, it happened in 100 cities, more than 100 cities. And in, um, in some of the cities, the unemployment rate exceeds 50 to 60 percent. Wow. That, that, no wonder the people are in the streets. Exactly. Yeah, 50 to 60 people percent, yeah. which is huge. Um, I, I started this out by noting that uh, Donald Trump was tweeting a lot, supposedly in support of the protesters and um, you know, blaming the, the repression of the government and uh, the government spending its money on terrorism and missiles and things like that. Did the average Iranian in the street hear that message, and how did they react to Donald Trump's position? Well, thanks to foreign media, thanks to satellite, international TV, Iranian are really up to date. So uh, even in tiny mini villages in Iran, people have access to Instagram, people have access to Facebook. So 
uh, that's globalization. You cannot censor media anymore that much because people in Iran are using VPN. Uh -huh. So they're using many devices, many softwares to bypass the filters and get the information. So, um, and yeah, foreign media are not only reflecting all the protests, but I can tell they exaggerated many things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, so back to our conversation about Trump's tweet. So yeah. uh, actually, uh, Trump tweeted dozens of tweets to support the protesters. And there is no evidence that the protesters in Iran are taking their cues from Trump or even paying attention to him. Unlike the 2009 protests, when some of the demonstrators called on President Obama to speak out against the Iranian government's right. brutal crackdown. I remember those days. So people were chanting, uh, Obama, join us, Obama, join us. Uh, that was the uh, really popular chant um, So in Tehran. And, and, and Obama was kind of hesitant exactly. to, to get Exactly. And it took there. like t uh, at least a week for Obama to, uh, to, to decide on that. Right. He had been in office about six months then, I think. This was um, summer of yes, 2009. 2009. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, um, I had a conversation with one of my colleagues, uh, which that time used to work for Department of State, and he told me that it took like a, exactly a week or 10 days for Obama to decide what kind of message we want to send to Iran. Yeah. But you see Trump, so he's waking up and he's tweeting like four tweets. <laughs> yeah. One after another. But um, yes, and no chant have heard in Iran calling on Trump to do so or say something any similar at all. So, um, and on the other hand, there is no evidence that the protests were orchestrated from abroad, right. even though there wasn't like indirect support from uh, foreign agents. but there wasn't any evidence that the protests were orchestrated from abroad. Um, and look at one thing. So Trump so far has tweeted 2,500 times <laughs> since he became the president. I don't know that I States. really wanted that. <laughs> so, and he, he has four tweets about human rights and all for Iran. Which kind That's of very interesting. Yeah, yeah, which kind of the, the value the notion of human rights? Yes. In yeah. fact, it's, it's a responsibility of not even US, but all the European countries to speak up against human rights violation in Iran. But when Trump is talking about that, there is no merit on that. Merit on that. Yeah, absolutely true. And I think that, that's an excellent point. I, I think I'll take that as a jumping off point to, to talk about um, the, the nuclear deal and Trump obviously has been doing everything he can. He was speaking against it as a major part of his campaign, and he's been working very hard to undermine the deal since then. And, and people uh, are very concerned that he's going to use these protests, among other things, uh, as a way of attacking the deal. And I, I think NIAC's um, executive director, Trita Parsi, um, wrote a piece called uh, How Trump Could Use Protests to kill the nuke deal. And he points out that, um, and I, I want to talk in some detail about this, but uh, back in the middle of last month, Trump essentially issued uh, an ultimatum. But he also announced new sanctions on, on uh, Iran based around the ballistic missile program, mm -hmm. which is not covered under the, the nuclear deal. We'll get into that detail. But in ordering those um, sanctions, it, the justification offered was, and this is quoting the White House, economic mismanagement and diversion of significant resources to fund threatening missile systems at the expense of Iran's citizenry. So now suddenly, instead of spending all their money on terrorism, which has been now there's, he's, the, Iran's government is spending its money on things other than, than its citizens. Does this make any sense at all? Well, <laughs> it's uh, hard to actually connect the dots when he's talking about Iran. So, but undermining the nuclear deal will make it more difficult for Washington and its allies to address the threat. So the Trump administration's more aggressive position toward Tehran is likely to reinforce Iranian leaders' 
um, an impression that the U.S. is an unreliable negotiating counterpart and that ballistic missiles are necessary for their country, country self-defense. So Iran's ballistic, let's talk about the history of ballistic program in Iran, sure. actually. So sure. it started in 1970 under the Shah. So at that time, Iranian developed uh, a short-range uh, ballistic missile. And today, Iran has many mid-range and short-range mi missiles. Um, so um, at this point, Iranian officials are claiming that Iran needs to develop its own defense. Because look, um, United States are selling arms to other countries in the region, Saudi Arabia. A lot of arms. Exactly, 17 billion to yeah. Saudi Arabia, yeah. or even more than that. And even tiny UAE, $12 billion. And Iran has no share. Right. So the Iranian government's point, point of view is that we need to develop something ourselves to be able to defend the country. And when you give us an idea, and I know you're not a scientist or engineer, but what does it mean, short range, medium range? Um, just in the neighborhood sort of thing? I mean, ne uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, neighborhood, I don't know what is like the the range of the missile, yeah. so I'm not familiar with that okay. exactly. Fair enough. I, I, <laughs> I'm not <a> political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I, I was hoping you might it's, know, but it's, it, really, it's, it, it's really just in the region. It, there's no threat to Europe. There's no th certainly no threat to the United States. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it, no. I, one of the reasons I bring that up was uh, George Bush famously was going to put missile defense in Europe to uh, defend against Iran's missiles. I don't know if you remember that. It was actually there for Russia, but he said it's to defend against Iran. So and let's talk about this recent ultimatum. I think it was January 11th when, uh, when Trump um, made the announcement that um, he did uh, renew, uh, under the, uh, the agreement and under the U.S. Congress's sort of approval of the agreement, uh, it was not like an actual treaty that needed uh, Senate approval, but Congress did weigh in, and they wanted a certification every 120 days, every mm -hmm. four months, that Iran was meeting the terms of the deal and that the sanctions would continue to, to be waived. And in, in January, Trump did waive the um, sanctions for another 120 days, but he also said, quoting, this is a last chance. In the absence of reworking the agreement, the United States will not again waive sanctions in order to stay in the Iran nuclear deal. And if at any time I judge that such a renewed agreement is not within reach, I will withdraw from the deal immediately. He, he wants Congress and the Europeans mm -hmm. to actually redo the deal, apparently with no Iranian input. Um, can you explain for our audience what he's demanding in, in this ultimatum. Let's start there. Yes, sure. Uh, so it's good to know that Trump didn't kill the deal, but he chose to decertify Iran's compliance with the agreement. He accused Iran of committing multiple violations of the agreement, and despite the fact that IAEA, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, and even its own government approved that Tehran is complying with the 2015 deal. Right. So Trump's um, just warned that he would do unilaterally withdraw from the deal. And that's kind of a major threat to even European Union because right now they, they have two decisions. So supporting the Trump administration or supporting the Iranian government. So they don't want to lose the business with the United States. Iran is a tiny market for them. Right. So there is a chance that they, even they withdraw from the, the nuclear deal, but uh, yeah. Um, so let's, let's go through a little bit of, of what Trump is demanding in, in this new deal. Uh, first of all, he wants to include the missiles, which were mm -hmm. specifically not part of the original agreement. And, and this was part of what diplomacy is all about. In order to get that nuclear agreement, um, Obama made the determination correct, I think, <clears throat> that it had to focus just on one issue at a time. And, and mm -hmm. the most immediate threat was the development of 
possible development of nuclear weapons. So the deal is only on, and, and we got to remember, Iran did not have nuclear weapons and wasn't close when, when the deal was signed. But now Trump wants to include the missiles, correct? That's right. Anything to add to that about what the missiles, what including the missiles might, might he wants an end so, to the testing, is that right? Yes, exactly. But um, here's the thing. I was reading an article but by Richard Nef Nephew, the former director of the national security of Iran during Obama's administration. So he was the brain behind all the sanctions against Iran, and he was the one of the key person um, during the Iran deal. So one of the person who did the negotiation with the Iranian officials. So um, as he mentioned, um, the, the, during negotiation over the G, JCPOA, the Iranians very insisted that their missile program was off the table. And despite their demand, the U.S. team still pursued as part of the JCPOA. And as part of the deal, the U.S. insisted on retaining U.N. Security Council sanctions on Iran's missile program for eight years into the JCPOA implementation period and will maintain its own sanctions indefinitely. So uh, again, there were some sanctions that were applied against Iran based on based the nuclear, on the, mm -hmm. whole different set of sanctions based on the missile, missile program. Missile program, exactly. Wh which are still in place. And if the missiles aren't included somehow in the agreement, the nuclear sanctions snap back on. As, That's as, exactly as, as true. Trump but here's the thing. So the missile program is not the main source of problem with the Iranian government. In fact, as Trump mentioned several times, the U.S. has a number of concerns with uh, respect to Iran, such as its sponsorship of terrorism, imprisonment of Iranian Americans on false claims and charges, and cyber attacks. And um, so it's unclear, even in the absence of missile program or the nuclear program, so would the relationship between these two countries mitigate? And it seems that Washington has like a really nearly infinite list of demands for the Iranian government. Yes, it, it is a long list. Uh, one is also, and, and I think this is an important point because we hear this a lot from uh, people in Washington, especially on Capitol Hill in Congress that, that do oppose the, uh, the nuclear accord with Iran, that, um, that certain provisions sunset after 10 or 15 years. Um, after, after this period of time, Iran can start running uh, centrifuges again to mm -hmm. uh, upgrade um, uranium and uh, different things like that. And so they make the claim that um, in 10 years, Iran can just go ahead and, and develop nuclear weapons. Is that true? Well, <laughs> it's actually really hard to comment on that yeah, because... Okay. Um, so, well, even Iranian government, they're not really as stable, so they're not a, they're not well, a reliable government. Who knows what government. the situation exactly. is going to be in 10 years. Exactly. So no one ever knows that what would happen in 10, 10 years yeah. from now. But, but part of it is that there are a lot of things, like the inspections of nuclear sites, do not sunset after 10 or 15 years. No. Those, those are permanent. They, they stay. And so it's only portions that, that actually expire in 10 or 15 years that these folks who oppose it are arguing, they make it seem as if the whole agreement goes away in, in 10 or 15 years, and it's not. Uh, some of the most uh, important parts of the agreement stay uh, permanently. And the other thing related to uh, the inspections is that Trump wants to expand the number of sites, um, wants to be able to go inspect anywhere in Iran, whereas the mm -hmm. agreement lists specific sites where the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy uh, Administration, knows that Iran was doing nuclear development work. But consider the level of intelligence the yeah. West incorporated in Iran, so it's kind of impossible for them to develop a new facility out of nowhere in Iran without CIA knowing that or any other intelligence agency in Europe knowing that. Um, yeah, with our satellite system, 
exactly. Iran is under inspection 24-7. Exactly. We, we all know the that. The whole country is under inspection. Um, just uh, quickly, because I do want to uh, move on to uh, some domestic issues for the Iranian-American community. But <clears throat> what has been the Europe? Europe hasn't said a whole lot yet about what they're doing. It, you mentioned they are in a real bind. Mm -hmm. uh, if they stick with the agreement, um, they may lose a lot of U.S. business, mm -hmm. and Iran's market doesn't make up for it. Um, but Airbus has already lost a deal because uh, Trump's threats, nobody wants to really invest in Iran right now anyway. Uh, but has there been reaction in Europe? Do, do we see anything that indicates where they might go uh, in response to Trump's ultimatum? Well, um, again, it's really hard to comment on that because the European Union has own position toward Iran and they're like pretty much undecided at this point. Yeah, that's, so that's my impression. I, I couldn't find a whole that, lot exactly. where anybody's So for saying, example, uh, President Macron um, yeah, approved the complying of Iran with the terms of the nuclear deal yes. and other president. So. Macron of France seems pretty determined to see the, exactly. the, the deal stay. Exactly. So you, EU has a different approach toward Iran. And uh, just, just quickly, uh, Trump's ultimatum about this deal was also directed to Congress, and he's calling on Congress to do something. Is there any movement there? No, there is no movement it, from it, Capitol Hill also. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't seem to, to be that way. To pass any law, yeah, because uh, Trump hmm. asked to pass um, a law or an act uh, to just decertify the, the nuclear deal. Yeah. 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 Congress without is going to. Without any renewing that. Yeah. yeah Congress is going to rewrite the, the entire deal yes. without talking to Iran. Um, I, I do want to move on to the Muslim ban, but I came across something that happened just today. I don't know if you've seen this, but I'll end up talking about the nuclear deal with this. Um, just today, uh, President Hassan Rouhani of Iran. Uh, said Iran remains committed to the nuclear accord. He said, quote, we will stay in the nuclear agreement as long as our interests are observed. The U.S. staying in or out of the accord will not be the main criteria for our decision. We have principles and will continue our commitment to the deal based on our principles. So it doesn't sound like he's going to be rushing off to the negotiating table, um, ultimatum or no ultimatum. But on the other hand, we should consider the pressure from the hardliners and conservatives in Iran. That is true. I mean, this was not an easy deal on, um, mm -hmm. on Rouhani. Rouhani was uh, president when this was signed? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yes. And uh, yeah, here's the thing. There is, there is already enough pressure over that, that. And they consider the deal as the thing that Iran lost, the deal. Already. The hardliners. The hardliners and yeah, conservatives. Yeah, so th this does not make his life any easier Exactly. Either. And um, <laughs> yeah, before talking about uh, all these kind of things, it's better to talk about Iran's economy because um, so it's hard to talk about the protest and just ignore the economy part of yeah. Iran. So you know that Iran is a young country. Uh, more than 60% of Iran is under 30 years old. Oh. So more than 70% of 18, 18 to 24 years old are in, enrolled in some form of higher education. So 80 percent? 80%, 70%, uh, sorry. Yeah. So like triple the rate just from 10 years ago. And the majority are unemployed. Amongst yeah. young Iranians who make up more than half the country's population, 40% are without work or a steady income. Uh -huh. Considering that inflation rate is around 12 percent, you might not have even a university degree, even have a master's degree or PhD, and end up driving a taxi or working for a supermarket. Yeah, it's uh, definitely an, an economic story. You, you're right. That's uh, one thing that, that we need to keep in mind. Uh, it, continuing U.S. sanctions and the threat of reimposing even more mm -hmm. sanctions um, based on the statistics you just gave, anybody can do the math. This is really going to hurt the Iranian people who are exactly. just the very people who are just out in the streets protesting these economic conditions. Yes. 
So uh, let me turn domestically because I know the uh, so-called Muslim ban has been um, really one of the major areas of uh, uh, NIAC's work, especially over, over the, the past year. Can you catch us up where we are on this, uh, roughly, or, or what's NIAC doing on it? And more importantly, what's the effect on the Iranian-American community here uh, on, on the Muslim ban? What do you want to say about your work on that and, and the effect of, of the ban? So uh, just a day after the Muslim ban, NIAC has started, ha has been working on the issue. And our legal team, our policy team in Washington, D.C., are trying so hard to find a way to at least block the Muslim ban. Or the, the main focus is just block it permanently. So there shouldn't be any Muslim ban. This is unconstitutional. It's against all the fundamental rights of this country. So to discriminate a nation based on their religion mm -hmm. and based on their background, it's uh, completely unconstitutional. So we are supporting the, our community. We are providing legal uh, advocacy rights for them. We are, promote, uh, we are um, providing free legal counsel for the community to file their lawsuits. And um, at lower courts, uh, there was a decision uh, a few weeks ago at 9th District right. in San Francisco, which blocked the Muslim ban. But unfortunately, the travel ban or Muslim ban is still in effect. Yeah. In, and it's hurting our community. In, in early December, the Supreme Court lifted the stay. And so that the Ninth Circuit had issued, um, which meant the administration can go ahead and enforce the ban. Um, or version number three, we're up to Muslim ban 3.0 now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of weeks later, back in the um, Ninth Circuit, the, there was a, a favorable ruling that ruled that uh, it, it was good for those who opposed the ban, because this is going to end up at the Supreme Court for final decision. But that ruling, as I understand it, basically said um, that such a broad ban like this, actually only Congress can do that. The president does not have the power to do that. So that gives the opponents a very strong footing when they go back to the Supreme Court, especially a, a somewhat, somewhat uh, conservative Supreme Court that wouldn't look favorably on presidential overreach. So there's bad news and good news. Uh, as far as I understand, this is supposed to be argued in the Supreme Court in about April mm -hmm. yes. uh, with a decision expected by, by late June. So maybe I'll have you back then and talk about it. Um, can you talk about some actual cases of, of where the ban has, has affected people? It's oh. keeping families apart. People can't even come to visit anymore. I mean, what has changed? for the Iranian-American community because of this ban, in addition to people who had hoped to come here to study and things like so that. So there a recent story, actually. So we have a large com Iranian-American community in Silicon Valley. The majority are working for the tech sectors. They're like uh, all the brilliant people finished their undergrad school and came to the US, finished their, got their uh, PhD or master's degree, and right now are working for major tech companies. but. Even these people are dealing with Muslim ban and the, and the consequences of the Muslim ban. For example, we had a case of a person who wor he was working for Google for more than five years. And um, so he had to leave the country to go to another country and obtain visa to renew his visa. Huh. And it took him around two months to renew the visa. So he had to be out of the country for two he months? He was, yeah, yeah, without his wife, without his family. He was in Dubai and then Turkey right after that for two months to, re to just renew his visa yeah. to come back to the US. So if this had been in effect in 2009 when you and your family left under political repression, you couldn't have gotten out. You couldn't have come here anyway. Exactly. Could you? Uh, that's, that's the story that I, I'm <laughs> reviewing daily with myself that if it was now, I wouldn't be able to come to this country, yeah, and I wasn't here. Yeah, you would be. You would be stuck there, huh? Okay, let's um, 
uh, bring our audience into this. If Crystal is around with the microphone, the way this works for our studio audience, just raise your hand, wait for Crystal to arrive with the microphone, and then if you would stand up and hold the mic right up to your uh, mouth and uh, ask your question. Let me, while the mic is getting delivered, ask one quick question. The um, Trump's latest immigration proposals and trying to work something out with the deal, uh, he wants to do away with the diversity visa lottery. Mm -hmm. I came across a statistic, I think, well, I hope you can uh, verify this, that Iran is the, gets the third largest number of these, these visas. So even that would have a really big effect big impact. Uh, on uh, Iranians being able to come here. Uh, even if there are some exceptions where for, for Iran, like I think students mm -hmm. can still come even under the Stud Muslim ban. Yes, students can come. But yeah. they, they probably wouldn't if the diversity uh, exactly. visa lottery goes. Exactly, and even the chain immigration, so. Yeah. He wants to family abolish. reunification. Exactly, yes. family reunification. Let's not yes. use chain <laughs> chain <laughs> migration. Okay, audience question here. Well, I was glad that you gave us a little better picture of the economic suffering in the countryside, which has led to these protests in all these small rural parts of Iran. And I'm wondering, um, also given what you said about the high unemployment rate of of, in many cases, well-educated young people. This must be so difficult, and I'm wondering what um, forces, if any, you think are able to move the country out from underneath the grip of this mafia, as you referred to mm -hmm. it, the corruption of the um, very um, militaristic, I guess, and, and uh, rigid, uh, I guess it's a, a sort of military element of the government. So could you tell us, we don't really hear a lot about um, how the people of Iran might be able to um, work their way out of this bind. I mean, it, it really sounds very difficult. We realize that our country is making it harder, but um, it's going to have to, a lot of it's going to have to come from people working internally, and I wonder if there's anything you can say about what's going on in that area and, and what we should look for or try to find ways to support because I don't think Donald Trump's tweets are really a very good way to support the aspirations of the people of Iran. Sure, thank you for your question. So the, as you know, the country is solely relying on selling oils, which mostly benefits <coughs> the Iranian government, government, not only the, not even the private sector. So. Uh, I was reading an estimate by IMF that uh, Iran would need $150 billion in foreign investment. But considering all the instability, all the insecurity that nuclear deal provided for Iran, so no foreign, gov no foreign company, no bank wants to give loan to Iran, or no foreign company wants to go there and invest in this country because of the instability. So, Today is sanctions over the nuclear program. Tomorrow is sanctions over the missile program. The day after is sanctions over human rights in violation. So they're not relying on Iranian market to go there and invest. And the government failed to do something to start a public project to bring the life back to the country. Here is the main problem, and unfortunately, the system is really corrupt. The level of embezzlement and sanctions worsen and worsen everything. So right now, the gap between the rich class and poor class is really wide. The sanctions made middle class almost disappear. And so the sanctions aren't really hurting the the individuals who constitute the government. It's, exactly. It's, it's hurting they the even average got, They even Iranians. got richer because they found a way to bypass the sanctions. You know, many cases of embezzlement. So we, have the, we had the largest case of embezzlement a few years ago in Iran with the cooperation of Turkish government and Azerbaijan government. Jeez. So they be, they, actually, they benefit from these sanctions. And all the pressures 
or a middle class and working poor class. Because they're not able to engage in smuggling and violations of the, the sanctions, no doubt. All right, we have another question here. And uh, be sure to hold the mic right up to your mouth. You mentioned that I think 70% of Iranians were educated or going to uh, college, mm -hmm. which is a very large percentage, perhaps bigger than we have here. 70% of the youth, I think you said, yeah. right? Yes, youth. Yes. So that's a larger percentage than here, I think. And so that must cost a lot of money. And so is that a significant amount of money that's used to subsidize or educate people who are probably not the poor farmers or children of poor farmers? Yeah. And is there any resentment among the poor farmers of this money going to educate the more wealthy people or the higher class people? So interesting question. Exactly what is the structure of question, But fortunately, it's kind of unbelievable because I know uh, going to the school here in the U.S. is pretty costly, but in Iran we have public schools which are free. So you can go to a school, you can obtain your degree for free. If you're smart, you can go to public school. On the other hand, we have private school, which is a little bit more expensive, but it's not that expensive to like, have a burden on the economy. So considering that, I don't know, they have like a sustainable way, way of um, universities. So it's less costly than here, than the United States. They don't have the student loan burdens they don't, like we do. We don't have anything as a student loan at all. So. Well, it may be free or almost free for the students, but somebody has to pay the rent, basically pay for heating and the buildings and the teachers, which presumably is the government. Uh, so it's not really free. It still costs money. Uh, better having it free for students than the system here. Yeah. But still, it costs the economy money. Money is going to the educational system rather than for, say, agricultural subsidies. It's definitely money is going into the education system, but the portion is not large enough for that. So there is no such a thing as a student loan or a scholarship. So and in every mini village in Iran, they have university. They have private universities or semi-private universities. So students have the option to go to, to the school close to their house. And the concept of moving to a different city to go to university is kind of really rare in Iran, unless you get accepted from like the top notch universities, which is in Tehran. Otherwise, people prefer to stay with their family and go to universities. So and the cost is not that big percentage for the government and to make people angry over that. I also just want to comment because I think the question makes a mistake that a lot of commentators make in this country talking about choices like this. It's not a zero-sum game in any society where a government is deciding how to spend resources. It's not a question of agriculture or college. Um, Societies invest in a broad array of things. So to, to say, to imply that it's denying money to agricultural support by paying for a university, I, I think creates a wrong assumption. And we do that here as well. And that, that's why I wanted to, to bring that up. Another audience question here. And right up to you. In this country, we tend to equate all those countries in the Middle East with Muslims. We're forgetting that 25% of Palestinians are Christians, for example. I have several friends from Iran who are very anti-Muslim, actually. How many, what percentage would you say of the people, the Iranians who are here, actually are non-Muslims, either not practicing or practicing other religions? What percentage non-Muslims? Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned Again, before, no there, is no, yeah. there is no demographics, there is no accurate number, but we have, of course, we have a large population of Jewish Iranian. We have a, a, like a high percentage of Jewish uh, Baha'i, I mean, uh, Iranian Baha'is or uh, Christians, but there is no number, actually. For, and here in the U.S. Exactly, yeah. here yeah. in the U.S. And it's pretty surprising, but uh, unlike other Middle Eastern countries, Iranians are not that religious. So they, the majority of the countries see Islam as something being forced to them during, during uh, Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh -huh. So here is the thing. So people are more secular. 
and as I mentioned the majority are educated and that makes the mindset being like uh, many, many more viral in Iran. There were just some uh, demonstrations in Iran uh, centered around wearing the hijab. hijab. Exactly. Yeah. So Talk you about saw that, that for a minute. Yes. Exactly. So there is a there is a campaign going on in Iran, and uh, women are removing their headscarf or just waving their headscarf over a stick and standing um, in like the busiest streets of Tehran. So here is the sign of that: that people don't want to be forced to practice Islam or cover their hair. Okay, uh, we have another question back here. Hi, thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first part is that I appreciate you mentioning the unconstitutional rights that the ban had violated. So I want you to suggest to us um, how can we practically support you and also women, uh, Iranian women especially. Because I um, supported two Iranian women who escaped <laughs> wow. from your country. And uh, they are at Stanford right now, and I'm tutoring them. So um, let me know how I, as a citizen of the United States, can support your people. Uh, for example, how can I effectively go to my congressman, and what kind of letter I can write, and also what kind of meeting I can set up or coordinate from uh, the uni university level to support you. That's one part. Second part is how can I um, Keep donate? Keep the mic close. Yeah. Keep the mic close. Yeah, and how can I donate uh, to support your organization as well? Thank you so much for supporting us. That, it means a lot to me. And um, actually, to support us, we, we would need volunteers. We would need more active people to, to be politically active and to reflect our voice and concerns to the government. For example, uh, we have a good relationship with uh, congresspersons in the Bay Area. We have a good relationship with Congresswoman uh, Anna Eshu here in Palo Alto, with Congressman uh, Rokana uh, in South Bay, and with Congresswoman Lofgren in San Jose. So let me know where do you live, and we can have a conversation after my talk here. And um, regarding the donation, <laughs> it might not <laughs> yes. be appropriate, but we can talk we, about we, it after we'll, the talk. We'll, we'll do that offline, yeah. Yes. Um, as a Northern California field organizer, do you have regular meetings or anything that people can get involved with? Or Yes, we have regular meetings. So, uh, for example, we had a meet and greet, a uh, happy hour meeting in San Francisco a week ago on Thursday. And I'm organizing an event uh, in Palo Alto, actually, um, in two weeks. So, so I if, can if people you... go to the NIAC website, they can get on a... Or Facebook. An... Follow us on, on uh, your Facebook. So there is, uh, there is a NIAC page, and we have a NIAC Northern California. Or feel free to add me on your Facebook. Um, yes, and in terms of our work here uh, in Northern California, right now we're collaborating with the county of San Mateo and county of Sacramento to educate the Iranian American community on California's voter choice. Based on this act, there is no official election day. There is an election month. So poll centers are open a month prior to the elections or 10 days prior to the election, and people can go and vote, and they have the option of same day registration. So we are trying to translate all the materials into Farsi, educate the community in, do, in these two counties, and um, let me know if you can help us with anything regarding that, or even educating your community, your friends about that. Okay, um, one more question. We've got time for one quick one. Anybody who hasn't asked the question yet? Okay, uh, come back down front here, Crystal, and uh, a quick one. You talked about your organization representing the Iranian-American community. Uh, my guess is that, like any group of people from places, there's a wide diversity of opinions about various political issues. So when you say you represent them, I, I can see about voting, everybody would kind of support that. But on other issues, what is the diversity of opinion? And are there other organizations which represent some opinions that are different than yours? Well, uh, 
there are lots of Iranians organizations focusing on different things but and unfortunately the community is really really divided so we have liberal people we have uh, Shah loyalists uh, which mainly are in... Still? It's, oh my God, you have no <laughs> idea. Yeah. I, I am surprised. We huh. have Mujahideens uh, who are communist Islamists, and uh, so they're like spread all across the country, in Canada, in Europe. So unfortunately, we are really divided, but in California, in Silicon Valley, uh, people are mostly liberal, and people have the, uh, have the same understanding as us. So we don't have any problem here, uh, but in different parts of the country, the nature is different and the dynamic is really different. So uh, my colleagues, for example, in Southern California are dealing with different issues. Um, so there is no organization in any part of the world, not for Iranian or American community, but or for all the communities to unite and organize all the people. Even here, we have Democrats, Republican, and Independent. So there is no such a thing as reuniting all the community, all the people. That's the beauty of a democracy. People have different opinions and different point of views, and we really value that. Excellent answer. Let me ask you just quickly, we're uh, almost out of time. Uh, going back to the, the Muslim ban, uh, it, it's going to the Supreme Court in April. We'll have a decision by June. If, if the Supreme Court does uphold the Muslim ban, at that point, the only way uh, to undo it would be to have Congress rescind it and, and say they can't do it. Is, is NIAC working on that? Yes, exactly. Actually, there is an act uh, introduced by, by Congresswoman Lofgren called the SOLVE Act. So unfortunately, uh, it didn't get enough support in the House to be passed or even to have a discussion over that in Congress. Uh, but yeah, NIAC is trying to push it and uh, we're working as much as we can to... We'll work on that after the November elections. Sure. You've been watching uh, Other Voices brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. My excellent guest has been Dornaz Mamarzia of the National Iranian American Council. Dornaz, thank you so much for joining thank us you. here tonight. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next month. We're going to talk about the new nuclear posture review. The country has some very bad posture. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Thank you.